Nearly 50 years after they changed the way the entire nation looks and deals with children with developmental disabilities, these five mothers got together to discuss how it all happened. So when the group got together mm -hmm. to form, they said they were going to form a school that would serve all children. And I was so excited about that initial meeting because they said we're going to serve everyone. <coughs> and I went up that uh, to the person who had given that talk and I said, then you will take Ginny. And she said, well, actually, we're just not equipped to serve Ginny right now. I didn't hear the rest of what she said, mm -hmm. um, but that was as I got home I realized that my daughter would never be protected unless I saw to it mm -hmm. that everyone <coughs> was served, mm -hmm. no matter mm -hmm. what. That it was mm -hmm. up to us to figure out how to solve the challenges, mm -hmm. and it was up to us to figure out uh, how to support these kids. For Janet, Cecile, Katie, Evelyn and Sally, and the parents of Sherry and Mary, the norm was not acceptable. So in the early 1960s, a handful of women who shared a common bond took the first steps towards the creation of a safe place for their children. They formed Northwest Center and began a movement that would ultimately affect the lives of thousands of overlooked and excluded children in our state. You, you remember they called the church basement schools, yeah, not because they were yeah. affiliated with any religion, mm -hmm. but because right. they would give free space. Exactly. But it took um, the new school, Hope Crest, Central School, and then there was a workshop uh, that was part of that yeah. steering yeah. committee. And what I recall so vividly was the constant um, hope coming from the parents that this would be for all children, yeah. mm -hmm. not any a right to reject anyone right. and that sort of set the stage of our mission I believe yeah, yeah. and we finally pulled it all together and uh, incorporated and became Northwest Center but change did not come easy uniting small schools was one thing fighting existing philosophies was another there was ARC was an organization for families of uh, yeah. uh, in which there were children with developmental disabilities the philosophy at the ARC at, at that time, it was composed mostly of parents who had their children in institutions and were working to better the conditions of institutions mm -hmm. were, were abysmal at the time, and, and rightfully so. But at the same time, that philosophy was in conflict with the parents, and we had difficulty even understanding why they would want uh, you know, their children in an institution. So we were very much anti-institution, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and so the conflict the debates, <laughs> you might call them, <laughs> were rather violent mm -hmm. at times. Well, you also have to remember how much pressure all of us parents were on to put our kids on the waiting list for institutions. Mm -hmm. Nobody even, uh, from the so-called professionals that we first interacted with, the doctors um, and the uh, whatever program people, they all assumed that the ultimate objective was when the child was five or six, because that was about the youngest age, mm -hmm. they would accept kids into a state institution, mm -hmm. um, would be on the waiting list that the kids would not be at home, they would not live at home. But it was the 60s, and change was in the air. Um, there was a huge change in our society. Uh, against the concept of institutionalizing mm -hmm. and accepting children, having them live in the home, in the community, go to schools. It was a huge change. And it was a time that made it easier for those of us that wanted to do the public school law. In 1965, Northwest Center became an official school with a board of directors, membership group, and leaders. The administrators came from the original four schools, and their philosophy did not coincide with the mothers. When the Northwest Center formed, they offered uh, the mothers at Northwest Center the opportunity to form a mother's guild. And so that ended up with 85 members, and if that isn't a, again, an impetus of revolutionary for getting organized, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that, that was the political that force of all persons. Of passion. Right, mm -hmm. the mothers, guild. the minute oh. the kids were rejected, uh, 
we were having, you know, parent meetings, which were primarily mothers because that was mm -hmm. held during the day and presumably fathers were working and so on. But they were not going to put up with these kids being rejected. And the administration at that time was led by a person who didn't share the philosophy of every child is wow. accepted. So we had a conflict a within president? our own, yeah, yes. a conflict within our own organization. I mean, the enemy is now within, mm -hmm. not out. So what did they do? But anyway, we we ousted the people who were serving as administrators at Northwest Center. It was the board, wasn't it? The whole board. Whole board. <laughs> Actually, what what happened was that Northwest Center had a by, a set of bylaws that um, gave uh, people voting rights if you were a member and you could be a member for paying ten dollars a year something like that mm -hmm. and then only those people could vote for the board of directors we wanted as uh, dissidents a copy of the membership list <laughs> but that was controlled by the administration and so they kept the membership list from us and, and so how did we, we get it in <laughs> <laughs> what we did was one day we got a screwdriver and unscrewed the padlock when the school was closed with my baby daughter in my arms and Aunt Peggy holding her baby and we just opened up the padlock on the school building and uh, it was actually not the Seattle Public School building, it was Northwest Center's building technically. <laughs> And we went in to the this. lawyer was very technical. <laughs> you know, listen to lawyers. <laughs> and so when we want some. So we um, we walked into the office and uh, got a copy of all of the membership list. And then that allowed us to send out letters and make phone and personal contact with all of the members for the upcoming um, election at Northwest Center, and we nominated Cecile, I believe, to be the, the, the uh, yeah. chairman of the board, or right. <laughs> whatever right. the title was. And then you went around firing people. <laughs> I did. <guess. Yeah. laughs> First thing and I of did. of course, we totally prevailed. Not content with founding a revolutionary new school, these same determined mothers set their sights on improving the laws of the state. The conversation that we had just casually with Ralph Monroe and he said, why don't you write a mandatory law? And we said, what is that? And he said it would just be a law that would say all children with disabilities will be served by the public schools. And we thought, well, there's an idea for you. We, yeah, we, <laughs> that was when we learned to read the state constitution. Right, and, <laughs> and there it was. That, oh, wow, it said that it is the paramount duty yeah. of the state to educate all children in Washington now, you know State. But and to had, back up the bill yeah. was the survey that, that Governor Evans had done through his Office of Fiscal Management, remember, to find how many they, they, kids, yeah, although it was a low figure, it was a lot more. Yeah. yeah. When they brought the, all the children, they just kept finding them. This was the beginning of House Bill 90. Uh, we had the bill introduced into the legislature. It was introduced three, three different mm -hmm. ways, which is unheard of. You only have to do it one way, and uh, we didn't know any better. Dee, I remember, I think most of all, is when we discovered that our bill was stuck in the Rules Committee. Mm -hmm. One of the legislators does not want there to be sanctions in that bill. In other words, if a school district failed to comply, what are you gonna do? Well, in our bill, we said, if a school district fails to comply with this law, money will be withheld from them. It was critical that that pass. Otherwise, we would just be restating the Constitution, which wasn't carrying the day. So, um, I said, what are we going to do? And he said, well, you'll have to talk to every legislator by Tuesday. And this was on a Saturday. So we all went to Olympia on Monday. We contacted all 96 members of the House. And the next day, it went on the floor and it passed. The bill passed through the legislature in one year, costing $500 instead of the five years and $50,000 that was anticipated. The work that you did on the Education for All bill, you, you worked as a team and as a group to get something through that actually your family members were older and when the bill was passed, 
Tommy didn't get no, to he did go not. to school. He never um, did. Patrick was too old. My brother mm -hmm. Jeff was too old. Mm -hmm. Coolidge got to take advantage of it. Yes, he but did. the important thing is, is that families work together to promote mm -hmm. the better for everyone, not mm -hmm. just their own individual family member. Mm -hmm. And um, you just, you, you worked for the greater good mm -hmm. of everyone. children. All children. Because we had the children That's right. who had no other place to go. 